Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister and reads, does she stand by all of her government's statements and actions? Mr Speaker, may I begin by congratulating the member on his new role? Uh, Mr Speaker, yes. In particular, I stand by this government's ongoing successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic, oh, yeah. that for the past two years has seen New Zealand have the lowest cumulative number of cases, hospitalisations and deaths per capita in the OECD. And now we can add extraordinarily high vaccination rates as well. At the same time, our economy has continued to, uh, to perform with record low levels of unemployment, high economic growth and some of the longest stretches without restrictions of any comparable country. Mr Speaker, over the past two years, this government and New Zealand has provided a strong response to a global pandemic that continues. It, of course, hasn't been easy, but the results tell the country's story. That is why I proudly stand by this government's statements and actions. Yeah. Why did her government spend more than $50 billion from its COVID fund before announcing any funding for extra ICU beds? Uh, Mr. Speaker, well, I, re I reject um, that, that question. Mr. Speaker, what we know, one of the most important things that needed to be need to be provided are not just the beds, but the staffing of the beds. Five nurses are required for every ICU. Five ICU nurses are required per bed. So not only have we got a, a 300 ICU or high dependency unit beds, and the ability to surge to 500. We put aside funding in the budget to ensure that we could train the staff That's required right. for the additional beds that we have. Does she, um, does she agree uh, with, uh, sorry, at any, sorry, uh, why did her government choose to prioritise things like eradicating wallabies, including a pandemic, over increasing the number of fully staffed ICU beds? Mr Speaker, again, I reject the premise of the member's question. So not only did we increase the amount of money that went into training our ICU staff, because that is the critical piece of the puzzle, we also have, of course, put in capital expenditure for ICU physical space as well. $10 million into the expansion of Tauranga's ICU space, new ICU facility at Waitakere, 12 additional beds in Canterbury, and in addition to the training that we've provided for ICU nurses, $544 million for the operational spending of staffing for those new beds. But Mr Speaker, the one thing I would say, our focus has been ensuring people don't end up in ICU That's in right. the first place. We want to save lives, not have a situation where people are critically unwell. David Seymour. If the problem with staffing more ICU beds was getting the nurses, why did it take until the 20th of October for the government to set aside MIQ space for nurses coming to look after those Kiwis she cares so much about? Mr Speaker, um, that is not true, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, Mr Speaker, as I said, the funding for the additional staff was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Second point, if you only rely on surge capacity, that is what happened in the UK. When you have ICU staff who come in to support a surge, an overwhelming of a health workforce, the death rate in ICU increases. Our goal has always been to stop that from occurring. If you are overwhelmed in a pandemic, people die, no matter how many staff you have. A point of order, David Seymour. Mr Speaker, my, my question was, was very specific. Uh, about MIQ, not about funding and not about the nature of staff, whether they were organised as search staff, but about MIQ capacity and when it was announced. She did not address that at all. Order. Order. The member started his question that way. Unfortunately, it had a tail which it opened it up for the answer. Mr Luxon. So why did Wellington ICU specialist Dr Paul Young say recently, quote, I challenge you to visit any ICU in the country and find one clinician, just one, who can show you their newly staffed ICU beds. Mr Speaker, as I've said, we have increased the support and funding for ICU staff. We've put an extra 100 million into capital funding for ICU beds. But Mr Speaker, uh, ultimately our goal has been to not to put pressure on that part of the system. At the peak of this outbreak, my recollection is that we've had 11 people in ICU.
We have had capacity throughout the pandemic in our ICUs. We've had surge capacity of an additional 200 beds. But, if you, Mr Speaker, the member's goal is to simply have capacity open up and flood the ICU. We have a very different view of pandemic management. At any point in the first 12 months of the pandemic, did she actually pick up the phone and instruct her health minister to increase the number of fully staffed ICU beds? If so, when? Uh, Mr Speaker, I've said multiple times now that part of our pandemic response, of course, has been about enabling not just physical beds, but the capability and capacity to properly staff them. You can convert a ward, Mr Speaker, but you need the qualified staff in order to operate it in a way that people do not die. We have funded that. Mr Speaker, though, again, I come back to the point. Throughout this pandemic, our issue has not been pressure on our ICU. Right. Our focus has been on making sure we don't have outbreaks there. that overwhelm our ICU. Yeah, yeah. If we at any point got to that level, it would mean contact tracing would have fallen over. It would have meant our public health units would be overwhelmed. It would have meant we would have been like many other countries, and we have not been. Why did it take her 21 months to announce additional funding for ICU beds when during the same time New South Wales was able to double their ICU capacity? Mr Speaker, if the member wishes to compare us to a state that had 75,000 cases, right. when enabling, when the state of, when the state of, Mr Speaker, and when the state of Victoria was setting up infrastructure in its car parks, then that is the member's prerogative. I think what it demonstrates is so no matter what your surge capacity is or your ICU beds, if you are overwhelmed, you are overwhelmed. No country in the world had capacity that allowed themselves to save people's lives if their ICU were overwhelmed. That has never been our goal. We had a different strategy. What does she say to the viaduct business owners I spoke with last week? who are utterly confused by her traffic light framework, which suggests that they should already be at green. And when will she finally tell them what actually is the criteria for a colour change? Before, before that happens, I, I've asked this side, it's the same for the other side, can you just leave it while questions are being asked? Mr Speaker, firstly I'd say I'm very pleased that we can see them open now and what I'm also pleased about is that people can go out with confidence knowing we have an outbreak that is contained and that they can enjoy hospitality services again. I would also say that we've very carefully designed the new framework so that it protects people's health but gives them certainty that at every level they can stay open. And finally Mr Speaker, uh, what I would say is what I've said all the way through, this transition point is different. We're easing in at a point where we already have an active outbreak. That's different from the rest of the times we've managed, uh, Mr Speaker, a framework before, and that's why we will be cautious about it. So again, what is the criteria to go to orange? Mr Speaker, as I've said in this House many times before and on the podium many times before, of course vaccination is only one issue, outbreak is another. Auckland is the epicentre of an outbreak in New Zealand that the rest of the country continues to be concerned about. On the one hand, we of course, Mr Speaker, have Auckland businesses that are pleased to be open and other parts of the country concerned about the spread of COVID. We have to manage all of those interests. Does she agree the failure to increase ICU beds during a pandemic is quite simply another illustration of her government's ongoing failure to deliver and to actually get things done? Mr Speaker, um, my view of delivery order, is the lowest order, case sides. numbers in the OECD, the lowest level of hospitalisation, right. the lowest death rate, right. record low unemployment, growth in our economy and debt rates relative to other countries in the OECD that are still far lower. Mr Speaker, I, manage, I measure our success in the well-being of our people and through joint efforts we have helped to keep them alive. Yeah.